present today is we are aiming at providing you an overview of um, our goals and some results and also some insights into the science policy practice interface. And then we will have uh, two thematic focuses, one by Anina on social values and one by Antoine on biodiversity modeling. The goal of Wildpark is to describe, survey and evaluate the ecological, social and economic benefits and added value of the ecological infrastructure. So this goal was um, written by the Federal Office of the Environment and they also um, had different sub goals that you see um, in the box. Uh, we will get back to some of them in the course of, of our presentation. And by the way, the picture that you see um, was taken during an excursion in one of our study regions, we are helping here team members uh, in their geomantics, geosemantic analysis, and Anina will explain a bit later um, what the geosemantic analysis is. Wildpark is part of the action plan of the Swiss biodiversity strategy. You see that at the top uh, right. So they have different pilot projects and Wildpark is part of one of the pilot projects. So this means that the project is fully financed by the Federal Office of the Environment, BAFU, and we also have a close collaboration with them. So we have monthly uh, meetings on the project coordination level and we have two or three meetings per year with the whole uh, accompanying group from BAFU and there is um, other stakeholders involved as well. In Valpark we work on two tiers. So we have tier one which is the national level and tier two is the more the local and regional level and there we closely collaborate with four parks that you see here. Uh, Gruyère Bay d'en Haut, Pinfin, Jura Park Argau, and Naturpark Beverin. And we will see later on when Anina is presenting how this um, collaboration is um, working with workshops, etc. So I've mentioned the term ecological infrastructure a lot. I guess that some of you are familiar with, with it already, others not. I let you read through this definition provided by Buffy. So this is what Bafu um, sees as ecological infrastructure, and you will see some of the same wording again in this green box here. Um, so it's about resilient and rich biodiversity, interconnected and su sufficient core areas and connectivity areas. But Walpark's focus is broader than just on ecology. So we also include ecosystem services or NCPs, and we also look at good quality of life. And, which is also important, we are not only looking at the present state, but also at <clears throat> potential scenarios or potential developments in the future, so until um, 2060. We have uh, different approaches and methods which are shown on this slide. and. Just to, to give you a bit of an overview. So we have the, the different topics. We have the social, economic, and ecological views, but we also look into planning and management. And we have a, a variety of different methods um, that we use. Anina will focus later on the social views and Antoine on some of the ecological views. When I say we, um, so this is uh, our group pictures um, from us. It's about 40 researchers from five Swiss universities working together. We are organized in thematic modules. We have regular exchanges within the teams, the modules. We also have cross-module discussion of specific topics. We have every year a two-day retreat, and these pictures were taken at the 
uh, at three of the retreats. Um, we have workshops in our study regions, excursions, monthly online coffee meetings with PhDs and postdocs and so on. So we have quite a, a close collaboration between this interdisciplinary team. What is very important in, in Wildpark is values, values of nature, values of uh, biodiversity. And we try to include different perspectives. And I just want to give you a short example. So if we look at the tree, we can value it um, because of its own value. So then we talk about intrinsic value. We can also value it because of its fruit, timber, etc. Then it's an instrumental value. And we can value it because of the experiences that we have with them or memories. So it's relational value. And we use all these, and they can be differentiated differently, but we use all these categories <laughs> of memories. And we also look at what belongs to nature and what should nature look like. So this is uh, one of the core aims of, of the project. And as mentioned before, we really aim at providing a holistic approach, and this should also provide stakeholders with better arguments why nature and landscape are valuable. At least this is also the motivation from, from the Federal Office of the Environment to finance uh, this project. Regarding the collaboration with or this, the science policy practice interface, um, we collaborate with stakeholders from tier one and from tier two. Um, for the overall messages and the recommendations, we organized two stakeholder workshops. On the right, you see a screenshot from the stakeholder um, workshop. The first one that we had, we also had another one in April last year. And on the left, you see again uh, some pictures from visits in our study regions, uh, where we also sometimes combined it with, with workshops. And right now, we are working on the synthesis report because Valpark project ends this year, end of this year, and we are working on a synthesis report that tries to combine um, all the different uh, results. You see here um, an overview of, of illustrations that we prepared for our second stakeholder workshop last mm -hmm. April. It was quite important for us to try to, um, yeah, to try to create such illustrations because they help us to try to condense the, the knowledge that we um, uh, created. And, but it was also very useful for the stakeholders to discuss with, to, to let them know or to illustrate to them what we are um, pro providing and to, to have um, feedback on this. And this is just an overview. And here on this list, you see some of the outputs that we are um, uh, preparing in Valpark. Some of them will now be explained by Anina and Antoine, but there is also, for example, monetary values of ecosystem services with which, which, on which we will not talk about today, or analysis of political instruments and actors. So you see it's really, uh, really broad what we are um, looking at. But as mentioned, the focus today is really on social views and ecological views. And with this, I hand over to Anina for the next part. Thank you so much, Roger. So I will start with illustrating a bit or like a few methods that we've used within kind of, we call ourselves the social team, but it's basically just we are social scientists. Um, and I will do this by, by using the example of the wolf in Natua Park Beverin. So I'm zooming in on just one of our study regions. So all of these methods were carried out in like different study regions and also on different scales. So the first method um, is a sense maker survey. It was conducted by colleagues from the University of Lausanne. And so it's a questionnaire, but it's based on micro narrative. So if you would um, take part in this survey, you would first share a short story of an experience in nature. And then the questions you answer um, were related 
to your story. And the, the goal of the questionnaire or the survey was to assess um, NCPs and importance of certain NCPs. Then we have qualitative methods, which are the transect walks, basically go along interviews that we conducted in all the four parks in Beverine, this were 10. We had focus group discussions where we used participatory mapping as a tool to guide the discussions. We had four such groups in Beverine with a total of 15 participants. And the fourth method, method I'd like to highlight here um, was conducted by colleagues from the University of Zurich, uh, the geosemantic analysis. In this case, they looked at media texts, um, all in all, uh, yeah, over, way over 700 articles that were published relating to Beverine region. So what we saw here was like, we started talking in this interdisciplinary team about our results. And so after the media analysis, the geosemantic analysis team was like, well, obviously the wolf is like the number one topic re related to nature uh, or conservation in this area because um, they had almost 200 articles out of the 700 were about the wolf in Beverine. They looked at as the time stretch from 2000 to 2022. They conducted a, a sentiment analysis um, and saw that the sentiment in the articles was mostly negative, slight, uh, slightly negative, but mostly kind of neutral. Um, but it was a lot about the wolf. And then we exchanged and we we're like, well, in our data, this kind of looks different. So moving over to the, the sense maker survey and also the go alongs, um, in the survey, very few, or actually just a couple of stories that people shared out of the 250 in the Beverine area contained the word wolf or for about a wolf. A bit more so in the go along interview. So we did not actually have a specific question about the wolf because we were more interested in kind of everyday experiences and like the meanings of nature and human nature relationships. So we kept it quite open, but people did bring up the wolf because they they live with the wolf, they, they are farmers, et cetera. And we did get a few different values attached to wolves. So the quotes you see below are all from the interviews. Um, you see the first one was talking yeah, about the wolf as a fascinating animal. Um, it's not that I think it should be eradicated. The second person brought up more of the political context of the wolf. So the interviews were conducted in 21, and I think it was 2020 when the hunting law was rejected. So this person um, related to that and said like, well, the hunting law was rejected mainly by the people from the lowlands and went on to explain, you know, I'm, I'm a farmer up here. I work with my sheep on the alpine pasture. Maybe people should come up here to kind of experience what it actually means to live with the wolf. But then what we also saw um, was that some people really didn't really feel like they had to talk about the wolf anymore. We call this the wolf fatigue. And this is um, shown by the third quote here. The person said like, at some point you don't feel like talking about it anymore. Like, you know, it's kind of that lock we are done. And so that's what we call the wolf fatigue. And this fatigue was even more um, uh, strongly in the, or shown more strongly in the, in the focus groups. And we call it actually the wolf silence because we had four focus groups and in none of them, the wolf was brought up. We asked people about where do you think nature is intact? You know, what's your favorite place out there in nature? The wolf didn't come up. And then one of our moderators asked the group at the end, like, why didn't you talk about the wolf? You know, it seems to be such a big topic. And this was the answer. You don't speak about that. That does not end well. You talk about money, but not the wolf. I give you a piece of advice. Don't talk about the wolf here, especially if it's recorded. Why not? Because the topic is so emotional, it's crazy, especially with the farmers, because I will protect the wolf, but this is something I can hardly address anymore. So this is what we call the wolf silence, like actively not wanting to talk about the wolf, especially in a kind of a semi-public setting. And so we really saw as a team um, using these, these mixed methods approach that there's a, a quite a big value in using these different methods to understand, especially kind of challenging conservation topics, 
um, it's really putting a media discourse into local context and understanding local um, discourses or, or silences as well. And that silence might also have a reason or a meaning to it. And so this is kind of one of our outcomes that we didn't even actively look for, but kind of helped us to put our different methods also in relation to each other. So for the second part of my part, um, I would just like to focus on the uh, qualitative methods. So those are the go-along interviews. All in all, we conducted 42 in all of the four parts and the focus group discussions, um, which are in total 12, 12 group and 52 participants. So what we were kind of focusing on in these methods was, of course, approaching societal values of the ecological infrastructure. Um, and we did that kind of through two main guiding questions. So the first was, what is the meaning of nature to different people? Also relating to what Roger explained earlier. So we are really interested in knowing not just what people like stakeholders think about or understand on the nature, but also us researchers. It was also part of, of the whole project. And then the second kind of entry point or guiding question is how do everyday practices uh, influence the meanings attached to rural landscapes? And here you see a switch from uh, ecological infrastructure to landscapes um, because we obviously work quite empirically and landscapes is the, is the term that we also use in, in our everyday language. So ecological infrastructure was a bit too abstract to use with our stakeholders, also with ourselves, I guess. Um, and then we are also interested in how these meanings are entangled with, with emotions. And I'd like to just add some explanations to this. Um, so we, we focus on everyday practices um, because obviously our places I and mean, people live in these parks, in these areas, and places become what they are through everyday practices way more than just like a one time, once in a lifetime experience that you might have. And then we focus on meanings and kind of less on values because values are really abstract and hard to approach uh, when you talk to people because it's something hard to voice or to describe. But we value things because we perceive meaning in them. Something is meaningful means we usually value it. And then the emotions come in um, because meanings become known through the emotions they induce. So if something is meaningful to, to you, you kind of feel an emotion and that's something you can share, for example, in, an, in a go along interview with between interviewee and interviewer. So here again are our four research areas and just one example of a go along interview. So you see, we, we also um, recorded the GPS data. So you see the walk we actually did. We took pictures along the way when the person explained this is some special spot or something important so we took pictures and then we also have the text that we recorded so we kind of have three data layers that we could um use and also yeah kind of use for for our analysis and here's one example of focus group discussion with this participatory mapping that, that we use as kind of yeah good to kind of foster the discussion what we see here, so you see on the bottom, we really use like a printout map and set around it and discuss. Um, and up top is like a digitized um, result of one group. And you saw we, we mapped so-called hotspots, the red ones, where we asked people uh, for meaningful places in the landscape in their everyday life. So they shared stories and explained why this spot in particular. We mapped cold spots, which are meaningless or non-meaningful places. Um, in the landscape that just yeah, don't have any particular meaning to them. Those are the blue spots. And then the third one, the third question we ask is where do you think nature is intact or the most intact in your region? And those are these green um, areas and spots. And this third question is one of the findings I kind of want to share today um, out of these methods. Um, because it was very interesting what kind of stories we got when talking about what is intact nature or what is nature to you in general. Um, and we found quite quickly that uh, dualisms like nature versus culture didn't help us to kind of analyze these stories 
or better understand um, what people mean by it. Um, and so we, what we resort to rather instead of nature, we, we kind of take the term nature culture because that kind of resonates more with what the people, our respondents told us, because mostly we have human-made landscape elements are also part of what respondents described to us as nature. And now it's a bit dark, but I can kind of explain to so the picture on the right. Um, there's a tree and then just behind the tree, there's a little bench, it sticks out a bit. And so this person here really said like, yeah, this is all nature. And the bench kind of was included in what nature meant to the person in this particular spot. So it wasn't just like the very natural things. Um, so that, and the, the third point here is really that the perceived intact nature um, wasn't or was seldom leave really untouched when we ask people. So I have two more quotes from interviews that should kind of illustrate this. Yes, in that sense, the wines are indeed nature because it lives and it needs water and it grows and such. But the question is, isn't it also artificial? And a second quote that I found very interesting because it has kind of a normative angle to it um, was this one. So we asked, well, what is nature to you? And the person said like, well, nature is being part of the whole or the earth, if you will. It's like an interplay. And if this interplay works, then everything works. And we are a part of it or should be a part of it. And so this um, quote actually was, or like the, the conversation happened in this exact spot that you see in the picture. So the bench was also part of nature and or this hole that the person um, explained. And she also said like, well, part of this hole is also the sound of the train that passes through in the valley. So you can see the train tracks a bit on, in the valley down there. But what, what wasn't part of it was the sound of the motorcycles passing by on the street. But it was kind of this assemblage of, of things that she described of being nature. So the second um, point that I want to share regarding findings um, was how important emotions of belonging were, but also temporalities when it comes to landscape meanings or why, why we find certain landscape elements or places in landscape meaningful. So memories are obviously very effective inducers of emotions. They, they do make us emotional, however positive or negative. Um, and especially being outside with people, um, we saw that memories are kind of relived, kind of through embodied experience in nature. So when you go back there and then you feel kind of almost what you've been feeling maybe years ago when you have a certain experience. And what we also, what, what we are now kind of thinking about is the importance of rhythm. So we were obviously walking a lot. So walking, walking is a rhythm in itself, but we are also kind of thinking about different kind of over layering rhythms. So it might be a rhythm of a daily, um, your daily visit to the pasture and you do something, you know, you work with the animals. It might be a weekly walk with a friend, a colleague, during work, so you kind of have a rhythm, a weekly rhythm of doing something again. It can also be a seasonal rhythm uh, that gives something meaning. So a person told us like, well, I know I know the seasons with my body. I can smell the seasons, I, I can hear the seasons. And kind of this seasonal rhythm kind of gives a place a meaning or a different meaning to a place because maybe a place is more meaningful in summer when you go up there on the pasture with your animals. And I have two more quotes from interviews about memories that I found quite interesting because they're both um, childhood memories, but slightly different. So the first um, quote was during an interview where we approached one very special tree. And the person said, sometimes the tears came and then I always went to this birch tree. I could recharge my batteries or I could leave the thing that had annoyed me up there and then I went, went back home. So it was a very particular tree that's still there. And that very tree has a very individual meaning to that person. The second quote here um, is a bit more interchangeable because the person said, and we used to play with the roots a lot as children when we went hiking. Well, my mom also used it to motivate us to keep walking. These are childhood memories that automatically come back to me when I do certain things. So I think that's really nice. So 
I was walking with this person on a path and there were these roots over the path, but I'll, these weren't the exact roots that she remembered playing um, as a kid with, but it was roots that kind of triggered emotions, memories, and that made this specific path more meaningful to her because she always kind of remembered the game and shared it with me, um, which was nice. So just a short intermediary conclusion regarding this, um, the social views on ecological infrastructure. So the first part was really just showing how we value a mixed methods approaches, and especially for understanding challenging topics or challenging conservation topics, such as the, the wolf. And then obviously the meanings which are created through our everyday practices and also our very embodied practices of walking, working, sitting, interacting with your animals, etc. And the emotions were extremely central and we could really also kind of feel them with, with the people while um, conducting interviews and sometimes also in the focus groups. Um, and now we are really more thinking around these temporalities, such as memories and rhythms and how they influence um, the meanings and especially um, kind of how we can incorporate these temporalities into the analysis of societal values of ecological infrastructure, because we often focus on the present and the future. And but now we see how forceful the, the past is as well. So and now I'll um, happily hand over to Antoine for the ecological views. <clears throat> Thank you, Alina. So uh, I'm Antoine and I was working on the uh, biodiversity modeling part of the project uh, as a postdoc. Uh, and uh, basically when I accepted the job, like the, the main mission uh, in the for the job position was to achieve the, the modeling of uh, all possible species uh, for which we had data in Switzerland uh, at a 25 meter resolution, which is a very high resolution. And for both current and also uh, future periods considering uh, climate change and uh, land use uh, land cover change uh, scenarios. So that was uh, that was uh, the the mission when starting uh, the postdoc. Uh, so just to 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 put uh, this uh, this goal in a in a broader context uh, on which uh, biodiversity modeling operates and uh, other kind of uh, environmental modeling is the one uh, of uh, the importance of developing models and scenarios uh, for management and anticipation. Uh, so this, uh, these highlights uh, are made uh, in uh, international organization reports, such as the IPBS or the IUCN for biodiversity or, uh, clim or climate for climate change by the IPCC. And these models and projection, uh, they should allow to uh, feed uh, spatial priorization, spatial optimization software, uh, for example, for, uh, for biodiversity uh, conservation planning. And uh, also they can be used uh, uh, in, uh, in parallel with projection, uh, environmental projection for climate, for land use and climate change to forecast what could uh, happen uh, in the future. And one, uh, when we are talking about biodiversity modeling, one uh, increasingly used uh, tool for achieving this objective are species distribution models. Uh, the concept of species, species distribution model is quite straightforward. Basically, uh, you are quantifying the relationship between species occurrence data uh, with uh, the uh, environmental factors uh, at play for explaining the distribution of the species. And you are doing that uh, through the use of uh, statistical models. Uh, it can be Several algorithms can be combined together. You can one specific algorithm. And this uh, modeling algorithm, they will allow uh, to quantify the response of the species to this set of environmental factors uh, that are influencing its potential distribution. And thanks to this model, you can then uh, extrapolate uh, the relationship between the species and the environment uh, in a continuous space as to obtain uh, spatial maps of uh, the potential distribution of the species. And this uh, little figure on the right uh, show you uh, how much this uh, species description model uh, had been used over the last two decades and uh, the variety of uh, applications for which they have been used, ranging for glo global change studies, spatial prioriz prioritization, of course, uh, but also to monitor biological invasion and uh, many more. One key focus uh, of uh, the SDM science that I have been interested in uh, during my postdoc is uh, around this key issue that 
many uh, national scale studies, such as it was the case in Valpar, the, the, the aim was really to model the, the spatial distribution of the species at a national extent, is that this national scale SDM study, they are often using national biodiversity monitoring program uh, that stop at the political border of, uh, of the countries. So these are generally very nice and very comprehensive data sets, but they don't integrate for all species uh, the full set of environmental conditions which these species occur. For example, typically for Switzerland, France, or Sweden, maybe less for North America, uh, one species that is found in the country can occur also uh, more north or more south and can experience drier, uh, wetter, or more warm or colder condition uh, that the model will ignore if you consider only uh, the political extent of the country and only the use of this da data set. And the problem is that when you, you, you fit a species distribution model uh, with this, what we will call this truncated, specially truncated data, is that it could lead to truncated response curve uh, that, uh, that trace the relationship of the species to a set of important factors. For example, here are four variables, uh, four climate variables, uh, and this is the species response uh, according to the model. When you use a truncated data set in red and versus a full data set in black, and you can see that the, the response curve we obtain can be very different. And of course, this will have implication when projecting the model uh, in space, but uh, more importantly, in time, if you don't learn correctly the true response of the species to this uh, set of environmental conditions. And this is, this is a problem that was known before I, uh, I uh, start my postdoc, of course. And uh, there, there, there has been like uh, several uh, studies around this, uh, around this uh, problem, and one Key solution that arises is the one uh, that consists in combining global and regional data in their, in their respective model and then assemble them together. Uh, here, one, one key solution that generally arises is the one consisting in fitting two models, one global scale model and one regional scale model. The, the role of the global model will be to capture the full uh, climatic niche uh, by uh, integrating Special occurrence data and climate data, for example, that, that can be found across a full range uh, of conditions that the species encounter globally. But one key issue uh, of this of this uh, of this problem is, of this model is that generally, to fit them, uh, we don't have uh, all the possible environmental variables that uh, need to be integrated to explain uh, the distribution of the species. Basically, the data that are available at this global scale are only climate data, but we all we will like more local, land use, land cover, vegetation factors. And also at this uh, global scale, uh, the data that are generally available, they are av available at a very coarse uh, spatial resolution, uh, which can be a problem when you want to uh, do some very local application. So that's why it's important to incorporate also a regional scale model that will allow considering uh, more local habitat factors, such as the one related to soil or land use condition, and also, generally, at this local scale, as I said, uh, you can access more highly resolved data, which will be useful in the end to obtain uh, high resolution uh, maps. Uh, but before I start uh, my postdoc, there was no end-to-end uh, -end SDM platform for achieving this. And that's why a key objective of this postdoc was also to develop a tool, a software that we call uh, NSDM for nested species modeling that will be able to do this. Uh, integration in a straightforward way, and that could also integrate all the state-of-the-art steps of uh, species distribution modeling, so from data preparation to core modeling to spatial prediction uh, that we uh, incorporate in this uh, NSDM software. And we we made an effort to build uh, all this uh, software around this specially nested hierarchical framework uh, that allow the combination of this global model and this regional model. So far, we have uh, we included two uh, strategies, two possible strategies to do uh, the, uh, the, the integration of these two models together. I'm mean, not going to the, to the detail of this strategy in this presentation, but if you're if you're curious, you, you can ask me more detail after that. Uh, and also, importantly, uh, we uh, we designed this uh, NSDM pipeline uh, around the high performance computing design, so uh, it can be easily plugged 
uh, to any uh, university or cluster or to any organization cluster, uh, which is needed for achieving uh, the parallel modeling of thousands of species that it was the objective uh, for this project uh, in a reasonable amount of time. And also importantly, what we uh, integrated in this uh, NSDM pipeline is an automated covariate selection tool that allow to start with a big bunch of, uh, of candidate covariate. Here we are talking about 4,000, 5,000 of potential candidate covariate uh, to individually uh, select for each species uh, the best subset of variable. Because when you are targeting that many species at the same time, it's impossible uh, to, to, to work with an expert-based selection for all these species. So you need to input some uh, automatism. And that, that's why we, uh, we developed this automatic variate selection tool and integrated in the software. And talking about uh, the predictor variables, so the candidate uh, covariates we use for modeling uh, the distribution of the species. Uh, when it was a big effort at the start of the project to gather all possible uh, layers that could have an importance for modeling the, the, uh, the species, considering uh, the, the variety of taxa we consider. Uh, so we we, we dredge a bit in all the uh, university GIS databases, uh, also like uh, Swiss Topo uh, archives, uh, Swiss Federal Office of Statistics. So to, to get together, together uh, more than 5,000 of uh, layer, uh, raster layer uh, of covering like many uh, environmental categories that we standardize. So they all share uh, the same uh, coordinate reference system, the same high resolution of 25 meter, and so they all share the same grid. And we put all these layers together in the SWECO 25 database that we recently published in scientific data. And we hope that this, uh, this uh, database will also be useful for many other ecological research projects uh, in Switzerland. And so using uh, this uh, SWECO 25 predictor database uh, in association uh, with uh, species occurrence data that we retrieve from uh, info species uh, databases. We proceed to the core modeling of all possible species for which we had enough data to, to do the modeling uh, to obtain special, special prediction for both current period and also future period. So far, considering two climate change scenarios, which are the RCP 4.5 and the RCP 8.5, so the moderate and high emission uh, scenarios. And so far, we achieved the modeling of uh, 7,000, about 7,000, uh, what we call common species, so species for which we had more than uh, 50 occurrences. And we are currently uh, uh, increasing the number of, uh, of, of, of models and species by including uh, 5,000 additional rare species, so species for which we, we, uh, we have between 10 and 50 occurrences. Uh, also for future and for current and future scenarios, we are also integrating now uh, land use and land cover chain scenarios. And all this uh, work is conducted at a 25 meter resolution. And I wanted here to, uh, to, to emphasize that it's uh, work that we are continuously improving. So for example, uh, so far we have done two main run uh, for this uh, 7,000 species. So each time we are trying to, uh, to, 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 uh, to take some perspective on what we achieve and to to correct, to do some adjustment, to, to proceed to some uh, to some refinement. So so this is really like a, a work which is con continuously ongoing. There, there, there is no really a final version of, of these maps. And this, this, the range of applications uh, to, that we uh, we are anticipating that for which one this map could be useful. Uh, they range for biodiversity monitoring, uh, climate and land use change studies, uh, and all, many more. And we, in the, in the context of, uh, of Valpa, uh, there, there, there was a strong wish to, 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 to share this map for uh, ecological infrastructure planning, uh, in particular by the canton, and also to, uh, to other more local uh, application. So this is uh, an example uh, of what the canton of Vaux already did uh, with this uh, map. So aggregating uh, at what they call the tram level uh, basically uh, grouping species according to their uh, ecological preferences and looking uh, or reassessing the uh, ecological connectivity uh, of uh, the territory. 
Here is a more zoom example uh, at the scale of the city of Lausanne, uh, where they also look at the, at the, at the connectivity uh, of, uh, of the habitats uh, within uh, the city. And in this last example, it's also uh, an ongoing application in, uh, in the canton of Zurich, uh, where they, they group uh, the species according uh, here also to their uh, ecological preferences. These are two examples for uh, wet, uh, wet, wet, wet species and dry species, and uh, they are looking at uh, which area should or could be uh, favored for ecological infrastructure. Planning. So that was all for me uh, uh, on, on this uh, uh, biodiversity modeling part. Uh, and more like <laughs> as, a, as a next step for the Valpar project, uh, we wanted to remind you that uh, all the results uh, from the diverse uh, work package uh, will still may be made available until the end of 2024, that all publication and data sets uh, will also be continuously uploaded uh, on uh, our website, so www.valpar.ch. And if you are looking for more basic or raw data, uh, they, they also can be accessed from data archives such as Yareta and Zenodo, uh, from which you can also access a large panel of uh, metadata. So thank you for your attention, and uh, we are happy to take your any questions. Thank you for this very nice presentation. We just feel so that it is a, a huge project uh, which is now coming to an end. Has, has anybody a question or a comment or one of the speakers? Not yet. Are there questions in the chat? Uh, the chat is visible here. There is a question oh, there. Okay, there is a question. Just to get things going Thanks ah, okay. for the interesting talk. Um, I like these integrated projects that take just little different disciplinary approaches and things, but the two presentations we've seen now were very, very different. And maybe the ones really focusing on species biodiversity as biodiversity, which is kind of one view of nature, whereas from, from the presentation about values, it was talking a lot more about landscapes. And I wonder how in this project, you'll bring these different perspectives together into planning and whether this is something that's been yes, a big I challenge think... or not, or how you plan to do that. You are working on it in the synthesis report, I think. So how do you bring this together? <laughs> Should that, I start yeah. and then you? Yeah. Well, it's the timing of this talk was a bit bad because yesterday <laughs> um, colleagues at ETH just finished some analysis where they brought together like quantitative data from the workshops with other data layers, also Antoine's um, species distribution model. Um, and so it's basically just kind of comparing, you know, our, what we call the hotspots, like meaningful places, for example, what we now saw in a first screening, um, bringing together different data layers was very super interesting and and seeing that in most parks we do have like preferred spots by the participants that are located in areas with higher for example red list high amount of red list, red list species um, or also different NCPs that were modeled by another colleague in, in Geneva so we are working on that now unfortunately it wasn't ready yet to present because I think that would be that would have been one example how we now, try to really integrate very different kinds of data sets. And it's super interesting for me as well. And I mean, the, the other part is watching. <laughs> I can maybe before you do the synthesis. <laughs> uh, there is like, uh, I have a, another concrete example in mind where how do we integrate this? It's like uh, for, for projecting uh, the species distribution model with uh, land use and cover scenarios. Uh, we are using uh, future land use and land cover data directly derived from a narrative uh, they, uh, they collected on the field. And so uh, that's, that's a example of how the two could, could be integrated. Yeah. And then maybe a third example is what our colleagues do at ETH when they um, do their scenarios of future development. So they integrate really data from biodiversity side and also from the social science side. 
and integrate it with um, management tools and also the um, policy and uh, policy tools and really try to, um, to to project this into the future and then with this you can also see what is needed to be done now to achieve this goal so but yeah you're right now this was very mm -hmm. separated but we are working right now at this uh, integration okay thank you professor mm -hmm. you and then Janine. And the, uh, along those lines, you had this little image that was in the slide before also that looked like a spatial map, but then a network, a uh, stakeholder network, or, or uh, no in between. Oh, am I, maybe I'm wrong now. Yeah, this one on the right side, your logo, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it kind of looks like you're combining a network approach with a spatial approach. Is that happening as part of this data integration or network integration? It's, the question is about the, if a, and you combine a network approach with a spatial approach. I just repeat it for the Zoom people. Not in our part. So we are sticking to the spatial part, and not, but I'm not sure if the um, political analysis, I think that they work with network approaches, but I couldn't, yeah. I wouldn't know more to say about that, but not in our Exactly. Audio. So they are trying to integrate this, but I'm not an expert on this and we ha don't have the results yet. So this is why I'm not able to present it yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Janine's question. Um, so I have a question for Ufman. Um, you say that uh, the data set become available. Uh, does that also refers to the species distribution models? I understand. Uh, no, so the, the species distribution models, uh, they, are, they, are, they, are, they, are, they will not be made available uh, in very soon. They have, they have been made available at an aggregated level for, for the content, so they can uh, start with the ecological aspects and stuff. But uh, as a scientific project, uh, it's, it's not much right enough, but we, we, it's <laughs> something we should discuss with, uh, with our species in, uh, in the next uh, months. It's, uh, how this, how to, to, to release these maps uh, at some point, because we, we want to also to, to, to publish them and to, to, to release them as a, as a scientific project. Uh, but the, the, they come under also, uh, a data sharing agreement we have with Info Species and that, uh, don't allow us to, to do that anymore. But I mean, I talked to Antoine like a year ago and they want to make it public in 2025. That's my latest information. Uh, I've, I've, uh, that would be a, that, that would be a, a good objective, yes. Because <laughs> I, we already work now with uh, Rafis, Rafi Vius, mm -hmm. um, but the ones, the species we deliver to him. So I think it would be great if it would be made accessible for all, because it's a buffer project after all. So the negotiations have started already a long time ago, um, and we are really trying to achieve this agreement together with Info Species. But of course, it's not only um, about, so not only Info Species needs to decide. There is there is also additional funding that is needed. But these negotiations take by place right now, and the goal is to have them available. But it's it will not be done until the end of this year within about part. What's the prospect? You know, you need a lot of maintenance of these species distribution models. There will be new data coming in. How is is that? Is there a plan how to handle that? This is Hello. exactly part of the well, negotiation. That's uh, also part of, of, uh, of the negotiation and uh, part of the transition also with the new project uh, uh, where we, are, we will continue this uh, and this uh, species distribution modeling efforts, continue to improve what we have and continue to improve the software. Uh, so yes, there is a, really a willingness of of, of moving this way and to to update uh, to update this product with the, the new records that that were made available since the beginning of Valpa. And yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other question? Yes. Back have, there. Have, ah, oh, yes. sorry. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. I have a question. Uh, so related to the first one, so the integration. So then, um, how this process of integration started? So. Fritz, from the beginning, so you were agree about the 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 greet the the resolution, or were like a, the project starting quite independently, and afterwards was like it seemed like to be integrated. So which might have like a higher 
level of difficulties if it is if it comes afterwards. So how was in in Barpart thought this integration from the beginning? So really with the same structure and say okay, if we so collect like this, we will be able. Or was like okay, everyone independently and the afterwards. Mm -hmm. No, so it was really from the very start. Um, I should actually prepare for another presentation. I should prepare this this planning uh, sheet that we produced at the very beginning. It it looked very complicated, but it was always the goal. So we have we are organized in five modules and different work packages. And from the very beginning, we tried to see how the different work packages are links linked and when which. Um, output must be ready for the others to be used. And we also really encouraged, not only encouraged, but also forced the team members to talk to each other, to exchange also interim results. So this was really from the very beginning. But then of course, as always in research projects, things change a bit, plans change, and then we also adapted to new things and new ideas came out. And I think in the end, what is coming out of Wall Park is even more than we expected at the beginning because we saw a lot of um, synergies and a lot of additional tools that we wanted to do. So, okay, uh, yeah, there is another question. <laughs> um, one question about the questioners. Uh, I don't know about the age of the people that were interviewed, but. Have you considered or maybe have you perceived any sign of shifting baseline syndrome about human perceptions or I don't know something on this line? Mm -hmm. I don't I don't know about the, the quantitative survey that was conducted by the colleagues in, in Lausanne, if they had any significant um like results regarding age influences. And for our, I mean we we work qualitatively, so I can't um, give you significance, um, but we do not really have, so we talk to people from 21 to 89. Um, it was quite stretched um, regarding age um, and also regarding backgrounds. But it was quite interesting to see that we couldn't really find a pattern, neither regarding age nor regarding even political backgrounds a bit. But then again, the very personal relationships were more similar than we thought talking to people from issuing different political views. That's what I can share with you. But I don't have the the exact data from the from the quantitative questionnaire, honestly. And I can't remember if they had but I'm sure they've checked for that. But if you're interested, I'm happy to share their results via email. Okay, yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Okay. Any other question or remark? Yeah, there is one. In the species distribution models, the future scenario models were increasing anthropogenic pressures in there. And if yes, were renewable energy developments in that? Yeah. I didn't get it. The, the last part. <clears throat> if renewable energy developments uh -huh. were in there. Alors, so anthropogenic pressure. Uh, so uh, I said that for, for the future projection we got so far, or the or the one illustrated on the, this. Uh, on this figure, it's like for the two relative concentration pathways, 4.5 and 8.5, that indirectly are some proxies for anthropogenic pressure, like the high emission with versus the moderate emission scenarios. In the version we currently we currently produce, there are no direct uh, um, forcing anthropogenic factors such as land use, land cover changes that could be more, have a more direct impact on it. Uh, we are working on this, like, uh, like, like as I said, inputting uh, land use and cover changes uh, develop uh, on the basis of narratives we collect on the, uh, they collect on the field. So uh, uh, yes, a, a version will be will integrate will integrate this uh, this forcing uh, soon. And as for the uh, energy uh, part, uh, I'm now working on uh, the Speed to Zero project also. Uh, I've been hired as a, as a postdoc uh, on, on which Catherine is, is part two. Um, and uh, here, uh, there will, of course, there will be uh, there will be like some uh, energy change scenarios that transition consideration because it's uh, the core focus of, uh, of the project. Okay, thank you. Any other urgent question? <laughs> Because everybody's hungry, I think. No question in the chat? Okay. <laughs>